Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? Let us hear these words from the opening chapter of Mark's gospel, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I am not even worthy to bend over and loosen the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the, this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. Well, I think all of us know that we could not survive in this world, we could not even flourish in this world without gifts without the things that enter into our life that we've not necessarily worked for or deserved, but just the many gifts of life have made life possible and also have made life wonderful. We've come off of a Thanksgiving season where we always thank God for our blessings and for the many gifts. And it's common, I think, for people to say that, you know, if you start trying to name the gifts that we have received in life, and I don't mean packages under the trees, I'm tree, I mean gifts, the gift of family, the gift of friendship, and all the other kind of gifts that we can receive, that if we set out to try and name them one by one, we don't have enough lifetime to name them all, do we? We're blessed with the giftedness of life. Life itself is a gift from God. You know, God didn't give us the gift of life because he owed us anything. God created us. Life is a gift, and it's a wonderful gift to be received. But I wonder sometimes if there are things that are actually gifts, but, you know, we don't tend to think of it in that term because, you know, maybe we worked hard for something. And we finally were able to receive what we worked hard for in life, whatever it might be. And we received that thing, and so we tend to think, well, you know, we deserved it, we worked for it, we earned it, so there's really not much of a, a, a thought of a gift. But then when you start to think about it, you say, you know, I wouldn't have been able to work to earn that thing if it hadn't been for that opportunity someone gave me. Or wouldn't have been able to, to work that job if it hadn't been for this person over here who assisted me. And that doesn't take away the earned nature of it, the, the work, hard work that we did to receive it, to get whatever it is we've been, we've been wanting. But even in that, if we think long enough and hard enough about it, we'll realize that in many ways, even all of that in some way is a gift. I'm not so sure we think of faith as a gift. Faith is something we have, 
or don't have. But in our, this Advent season, as we we're reflecting on the gifts of the season, and last week we talked about hope is a gift, and that makes sense to us, but how is faith a gift? How is my faith a gift? How is your faith a gift? Mark's gospel starts out with a shout. We don't read it that way, but it does. You ever had a sleepless night? We all have. Maybe we're struggling to, to sleep or to get to sleep or we wake up and can't get to sleep. Perhaps there's something that's on our mind that we're worried about. Maybe it's just one of those nights where we just are struggling to sleep. And boy, when you're having a hard time getting to sleep, the night is long, isn't it? And then you manage at some point, ah, you don't know exactly when, maybe it was 4.30, you manage to fall asleep, and all of a sudden, the alarm rings. And it's a terrible sound, isn't it? It wakes you up like a shot, and you, you open your eyes, and you're groggy because you haven't had much sleep, and you turn off the alarm and you're debating, should I just roll back over? Oh, I can't, I gotta be somewhere, I gotta get up. It's a shock to the system. And that's how Mark's gospel starts out. Mark doesn't do what Matthew and Luke does, that we read the Christmas stories, the birth narratives at this time of the year, which come exclusively from Matthew and Luke. Mark doesn't start out with that. He doesn't start out with the genealogy of, of Jesus' uh, ancestors, doesn't get us into the story leading to Jesus' ministry. He starts right off the bat saying, the good news is here, and this is the start. And the good news starts with Jesus. Get ready, wake up. And in fact, that's John's, John the Baptist's job, isn't it? Wake up. It's coming. Prepare the way. And John helps the people prepare the way by, by doing something that would have reminded them of a story long ago. Come down to the waters of the Jordan River, that same river where our ancestors crossed over into the Promised Land. Come down to that river, be baptized, repent, get your life together, get your act together. That's what repent means, get it together. Because salvation is at hand, repent and believe, have faith. And in baptizing, what John would have reminded the people was that now, at last, the final fulfillment of that story way back in Israel's history of deliverance from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, that freedom, that story of freedom and deliverance. And now John is saying the final deliverance is at hand, the deliverance from the Egypt of our sin, the deliverance from all that sets us at one another, the deliverance of everything that's that, that's broken and not the way it's supposed to be, come down as a sign, just as the children of Israel crossed that Red Sea, John put the people into the river Jordan, into the waters, and coming up out of the water is a reminder that now that final deliverance was at hand, you see, the people couldn't believe in that deliverance if it hadn't been for the gift. The gift of their history. The gift of God's presence with them. The gift of the reminder that the God who freed them from slavery in Egypt 1,300 years earlier was now offering the gift of salvation once and for all and it was those stories, it was the presence of God, it was the continued demonstration of God's love for his people that was a gift 
that enabled them to have faith that God finally is keeping God's promises. I bet it got tough after a while. I bet it did. Israel comes back from exile in Babylon. We're talking 538 B.C., so some 500 and plus years before Jesus. And it seems like that they don't really have their own affairs uh, in their own hands for very long when they have to deal with the Syrians and they have to deal with the Persians and the Greeks and then they finally have to deal with the Romans and they feel and we know some of the early rabbis talked about that in their that they were in their own homeland but because Rome was in charge they were actually just kind of still in exile. And you just wonder if some, after all these centuries, had just given up. Who finally said, boy, if God's going to keep his promises, he's sure, he's sure slow about it. You know, God's time isn't always our time. But for those who kept the faith, for those who did weekly what we do weekly, for those who would gather together in the synagogue and offer prayers and read the scriptures, the rabbi offering a message from the scriptures, one of hope, that God was still with them and that God was coming, that continued reminder, reminder of what's going on, a reminder of who they are and what they're about and what God is doing. It helped them, those gifts, of re the gift of reminder helped them to continue on in the faith. Help them to continue to believe. And that's what we do, don't we? And we do this every year. We gather here every year for Advent. Every year. I've been preaching Advent sermons for 35 years. And at some point, someone says to me every now and then, doesn't it get old? And the answer is, no. Well, don't you after a while wonder that you can find a new angle on this scripture passage? The answer is, it's not my job to find a new angle. It's my job and our job in this time together to just remember. Remember what we hear every year. Remember, remember what we read every year. Light the same Advent candles every year. Sing the same songs every year. Why? Because if there's one thing we learn from the scriptures, among other things, among many other things, if there's one thing we learn from the scriptures is that we human beings are a forgetful people. We forget. We need to be reminded. And we see this all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If we don't pay attention, if we're not intentional about our prayers and our worship and our scripture reading and our service, if we're not intentional about it, we can forget. We can forget. And so it's the gift, the gifts of our story, the gifts of our faith, the gift of scripture, the gift of telling it over and over again. That really ignites in us the gift of our continued faith, that we can still go on. In spite of what we see in the world sometimes, in spite of those who perhaps have given up, I know some people who have. Throughout my life, I've known some people who at one point believed, and for whatever reason, they've given up. But we gather here, and we can continue, and we can remember, and we can leave this place with a renewed sense of faith. Because we know that the God who delivered his people from Egypt the God who delivered his people in Jesus Christ on the cross and in the resurrection will keep God's promises and one day in God's good time will deliver us once and for all. 
So the vision of the last couple of chapters of Revelation comes true, that, that the home of God is with us, God dwells with them, and God will be their God, and they will be his people, and what, what, what does it say? There'll be no more crying, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more suffering. All of those things will have passed away. But in the midst of this current age of suffering, we gather here to remember so that we continue to believe that God will make good on God's promises. We do this every time we come to the Lord's table, as we do this morning. That after 2,000 years of coming to the table of the Lord, we are reminded of Jesus' words to those first disciples at the Last Supper when he lifts the cup and he says, I will not drink of this until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, we do this because we have faith and we desire that in this that our faith is strengthened because we look forward to the day when finally in eternity with everyone who believes that we will join Jesus in his very presence and lift that cup together. Advent is a preparation for the coming of Jesus' first coming and a reminder that his second coming will indeed take place in God's good time. And how do we know that? How can we have faith in that? We have faith in that because Jesus said he would. And Jesus keeps his promises. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for all the gifts that strengthen our faith. For the great ability, the gift to worship and to sing and to reflect and to pray. To ponder in silence. The gift of service to one another. The gift of relationships that remind us that you are a God above all who desires to be in relationship with us. So we thank you this day for the gift of faith and help us as we journey in faith. Help us not to keep the faith for ourselves, but in ways that you discern for us. Help us to give that faith away to others. In Jesus' name.